And the, that as he is enthroned there, he is the receiving the acclamations of holy, 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 which uh, uh, ascribe to him that moral, ethical excellence uh, which characterizes his rule as the judge on a, a throne whose foundations are equity and truth. And then thirdly, there is uh, the obvious uh, feature of uh, the, the radiance, the visible radiance, luminosity, and so on of the divine glory and presence. So those three components and that uh, now we might expect them, and in our expectations we are we are justified. It turns out that these will be the, the major elements then that are found in connection with the predication uh, to man of uh, being the image of God, and so that's what we want to establish at this point. And just by way of, of comparing what we are doing here methodologically with what usually goes on in, in systematic theology when you come to this particular point. I, I would say that in um, systematic theology under, under the, the heading of image of God, what really is going on is an analysis of what constitutes humanness, which is a related but not the same subject. So what it means that man is image of God is a, a very big important element in what uh, constitutes humanness. Uh, uh, what distinguishes, let's say, human beings from animals and so on. Uh, but then there, there can be other things that are said uh, on that other store which are not part of what, as I see it exegetically, we, we would get out of the biblical data describing man as the image of uh, God. And traditionally then, when the other method is followed, uh, what we have ended up with was a sort of a two-layered theory of man as image of God there's the broader bottom layer of the cake uh, which expresses certain general faculties that man has that would distinguish him let's say again from, from human beings the cognitive the will and so on and so on uh, and there are these general faculties without uh, regard to their their moral character and so on but then there's the second layer on the cake that constitutes the image of God uh, namely the conformitas of the the, the ethical uh, likeness of man to God. And uh, unhappily, sometimes in, in, in analyzing this subject and the effect of the fall upon this uh, is to think that in the fall of man, only the, the second layer of this uh, two-layer cake gets knocked off, but that the bottom broad faculty is uh, a notion that uh, still remains pretty much intact and uh, it, one ends up therefore with more of a Roman Catholic type analysis of things uh, than a, a radically uh, reformational uh, view of it but um, what I'm primarily concerned to do here in terms of method is to be following an exegetical method and, and uh, not abstractly thinking well we are made in the image of God but uh, God what? Uh, I think the exegetical evidence is, is saying that specifically we are created in the image of God as he reveals himself in this glory spirit phenomenon, whether it, it, in the, the heavenly reality or he comes to earth as the glory spirit who fills the, the tabernacle and throne there, the holy of holies, the luminous presence, but the whole picture, whether at the heavenly level or the lower register typological level, that's the precise point of reference, the precise point of reference when God says, let us make man in our image. <laughs> and uh, so, as I said, it becomes a matter of analyzing what is the nature of that precise point of reference. And we've done that. And now let's see how those same three features do, as a matter of fact, uh, attend the, the biblical uh, data concerning man as the image of God. <clears throat> and so we're limiting ourselves, for the most part, to the to the data in the, the book of Genesis are references to that specific language of man as the, as the image of God. Now, the first component, you know, we've already talked about it, is uh, the, the judicial element, uh, the judicial feature. We are like God in that we are involved in a, a royal judicial appointment to rule over the earth, to exercise judgment in, in, in various uh, uh, ways. <coughs> So let's just look again at the passages that specifically uh, say man is the image of God and see what is associated with them, uh, starting with the first one, where it's very obvious this business of dominion. 
in, uh, in fact, it is uh, so uh, dominant and conspicuous here that, that, that some will settle for it, that that's the, the whole idea of the man as image of God, is this, this idea of, of rulership and dominion, under God to be sure, but nevertheless uh, uh, rulership and, and dominion. And, well, we needn't uh, uh, deal with that length. A simple quotation brings it out well enough. Let us make man in our image and our likeness and let them rule. All right, there's the connection. In our likeness, let them rule in, in the area which is now assigned uh, uh, to the end. The Lord of the seventh day rules over all. Man of the sixth day rules over the, the realm of, of uh, the sixth day. And over all the creatures that move along the ground. And so he made man in his own image and he blessed them. And he has spelled out their rule and dominion over the world by telling them how to go about it, be fruitful and increase and fill the earth and subdue it and rule over it again and again. So uh, clearly dominion, uh, rulership, is, is a godlike feature that is in, in view. And then we were just looking at uh, or referring to Psalm 8, uh, where again the same point is made when now man's likeness to God is spoken of as man's being made a little lower than the angels, all in connection with a uh, wondering a restatement of the way in which God made man to rule over all of the animals and the fish of the sea and so on. So Psalm 8, insofar as it is a, a reflective interpretation on Genesis 1, 26, 27, uh, underscores uh, the same point. Now we can come back to Genesis 3, 22, at which we looked earlier just uh, in terms of its use of the let us plural, and we're saying that uh, the let us is explained there by the presence of the uh, cherry bim. And uh, now the question that we're interested in is uh, in what respect uh, does God say that man is, is uh, like us, like one of us? And the point is now he has become like one of us with respect to the knowing of good and evil. Okay, that gets us involved in, in the question beforehand. Another one of these things we'll have to tackle it again in due course when we talk about the prohibition. But here's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil which confronts man with, uh, uh, with a, a function. That he, it's, it's a task, it's a probationary task, but it's also a function that he's going to perform. And uh, the, the way I see it, and I've already brought this out in other connections, but the, the way I, I see it, what is involved there, the tree of the knowing of good and evil, that this is a, uh, a telling of man beforehand that in connection with this particular tree, and later on it was going to... Uh, yes, Satan comes and, and, and brings this uh, uh, tree in, in, into the, the picture and the temptation. But it was going to be in connection with this particular tree, God is telling man, that, that you are going to be uh, called upon to function, to discern between good and, and evil. This is not the place where you are going to get new information about good or new information about evil. As though you, you didn't know the difference between them before. If you didn't know the difference between them, you, you, couldn't, you wouldn't be responsible. Man knows the difference between good and evil. This tree is not going to give it to him. But this tree is a place where he's going to have to use his knowledge of the difference between good and evil and to, to apply it in a judicial circumstance where, where as uh, I've said repeatedly, Satan in God's uh, arrangement is going to be brought into the garden to change the probation into a temptation where Satan is going to be permitted to assault uh, the mountain of God and the glory of, of God and, and to undercut the, the authority of God and where confronted with that, Adam will be challenged in a godlike way to exercise judgment and to pronounce Satan as evil and, and to judge him. And uh, that makes that is the point then. And and uh, we will later on be noticing that the the language that is used here, the tree of the knowing of good and evil, the discerning of good and evil, is a language which elsewhere is used for a king like David or Solomon when someone will come to them and say, oh, you are like God, or you, you are like the angel of God with respect to the knowing of good and evil, so that you have to determine which one of these women Solomon is lying about the, the, the baby, whose it is, and so on. That's a discerning, a knowing of good and evil. That's the kind of thing that is uh, meant by, by this uh, uh, tree. And in Genesis 3.22, that kind of judicial function is, uh, is called a being like unto uh, 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 God. Uh, the next one that we'll deal with is uh, uh, in chapter 9, verse 6 <coughs> in Genesis. This is the last one in Genesis. Now, there aren't that many passages that are very uh, us using this concept very specifically. Genesis 9, 6, 
Where are we? We're after the flood. We're within the covenant of common grace. God has uh, just been setting up uh, the, the institution of, of the state for the second time. The institution of the state was set up uh, before the flood, back in Genesis 4.15 already. But now after the flood, God is reestablishing the, the, the common grace order and including then the institution of the state. And so whoever sheds man's blood by man shall his blood uh, be shed is uh, what uh, is, uh, is stated there. There, there will be a, a, a divine arrangement for law and order and, and uh, the, the punishment of, of, of criminal acts and, and, and so forth. And now what we're interested in is the explanation by man shall his blood be shed. The explanation that is given because the explanation is in terms of someone being the image of God. Mm. By man shall his blood be shed for in the image of God. Uh, God created. Uh, how does it go? <coughs> Whoever sheds the blood of man by man shall his blood be shed for in the image of God is God, God made a man. Traditional interpretation. Traditional interpretation. How is it that so severe a penalty is imposed for the taking of a human life? The answer, the human life is the life of one who is made in the image of God, and therefore so heinous is that crime uh, that it deserves the death penalty. That's the traditional interpretation. It's obviously a very plausible one. I don't think it's the right one. The, I think what is going on is it's not explaining how great the crime was, and therefore that it deserves the punishment. But it is uh, rather answering the question, how can it be that man should have the, the, the solemn obligation and, and, and duty uh, to uh, take the life of another human being? And the answer is because <laughs> this is the very nature of, of man that he's made in the image of God to exercise judgment. And beyond the, the, the exercising of judgment over other men, Paul adds to the thought, and don't you know that we're even going to judge angels? <laughs> Uh, and, uh, and and so this is part and parcel of what it means to be made in the image of God, and therefore uh, utterly appropriate uh, that uh, man should be given uh, this supreme judicial uh, function of uh, the ultimate punishment of capital uh, uh, punishment. So uh, uh, there, there again, image of Godness and uh, and the dominion judicial capacity. Uh, are, are linked and, and uh, Psalm 82 would be right on target again you see the, that whole exposition I just tried to give of Psalm 82 you can recall here and it uh, once again uh, is, is dealing with the, the God likeness of angels and men all of them are like Elohim beings and what is it that constitutes their Elohim beings in that passage in the case of the angels because they are sitting down in the divine council with God in the case of men because like the angels of God, they are executing a rule on the earth. So Psalm 82 is, 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 uh, is another solid contribution to this equation of image of God and the exercise of the judicial uh, uh, function. The next uh, category that we uh, deal with, God is enthroned, the glory spirit is an enthronement, and it's one that is characterized by, by the, the the utmost in the, in the way of, of, of justice, goodness, righteousness, uh, and, uh, and truth. This feature comes out in, in biblical references to man as image of God, especially in man's being recreated in the image of God. Mm-hmm. And uh, the two classic passages, uh, you know, I, I spoke about the traditional two-layer K thing, and, and, and when they are trying to find biblical data then for the second layer, the fact that man is inwardly, uh, conform to God. The, the two classic passages that are appealed to, and which I will appeal to here, is the second ingredient: uh, Ephesians 4:24, Ephesians 4:24, and Colossians. What is it? 3:10. Ephesians 4:24 and Colossians 3:10, which you will recall are referring to, to our being recreated in the image of God in Christ Jesus in righteousness, holiness, and the love of the truth. Hmm? So, our, our recreation is, uh, is putting us back in the situation of, of uh, our, our original creation, which would have been also, therefore, one characterized uh, by the imparting of righteousness, holiness, love of the truth. But as we've said, there was room to move on. A man was made not just uh, morally neutral or something, he was made morally upright in this way, reflecting the moral excellence of God, uh, and that there was indeed uh, room for <coughs> advance, advance this Probation, there would have been that confirmation in righteousness so that he would never again be able to, even to sin. 
But even apart from, from uh, that confirmation, right from the outset, uh, man was uh, possessed of a moral excellence like, like that of God. Now, mind you, not just a moral faculty, not just a moral faculty, but moral excellence. Yeah. The, the devil has a moral faculty, uh, doesn't have moral excellence. But man was created not just with moral excellence, but with, uh, with moral faculty that would distinguish him from animals, huh? Uh, but he was created with a moral excellence like that of, of the, the glory uh, uh, spirit, yes. Um, since the reprobate won't be conformed to the image of Christ, and there's an uh, so I'll, I'll work through, I think, a, a, a sort of a, a history of the subject, which will, I think, answer the question you're about to ask if you could hold up. Okay. Uh, because you, you're quite on the right track that you, in, in uh, answering, when, when dealing with the subject of man as image of God, you have to answer not only what but when. And you're getting at the, the when at, a, at some other point along the line. So right now we're just trying to answer the question, what What are the components uh, that constituted the image of God uh, like this, especially right at the, at, the, at the creation at the beginning? Now the third, the third feature then is the, the one that uh, might seem strangest since, since uh, it's the one of visible luminosity and so on. Uh, to speak of any feature that, that seems to have a physical aspect to it seems out of order since God is a spirit and has not a body like men as we teach our kids and so on, which is uh, true. And so how can there, there be a physical component in God likeness since God uh, doesn't have a body uh, like men? Well, the answer to that, of course, you know, of course, God doesn't have a body like men, but he does reveal himself you know, within the created uh, physical universe that there is, there is a visible uh, embodiment of, of, of God, or uh, that called the endoxation, the endoxate uh, spirit, and uh, which involves this actual uh, physical, if you will, phenomenon of, of visible radiant luminosity, light like phenomenon. And uh, that being the precise point of reference, when God says, Let us make man in our likeness, not some God, the spirit in eternity apart from this, but likeness to, to, to this particular theophanic uh, presence and revelation of God, there's no problem then in, in, in seeing a connection, and the Bible does seem to bring out that, that physical glorification, the biblical term for it, all right? Uh, glorification, which is uh, not that our uh, perfect sanctification within, but it's physical glorification in terms of our external body, so the resurrection body and so on. Uh, this, this feature is, is a, a, a one then that we do find when the scriptures are saying that we are going to be, we are like the Lord and we will be like uh, the Lord. And, uh, well, the, uh, a couple of passages quickly in, in Philippians 3.21, uh, it, it, it does, uh, that's the one about uh, when we see the, is that the one that, uh, let me see. Someone have it there quickly? Okay, are, are being made to the likeness of the body of his glory, which uh, certainly involves uh, the, the feature that we're talking about. Thank you. And uh, then First John 3, 2, if someone could be looking that one up and, uh, and reading it for us in a moment. And First um, John 3, 2. I'm looking here now, of course, at 1 Corinthians 15, where it's talking about the resurrection body and the glory of, of, of that body and so on. So there is a natural body. It's raised a spiritual body. There, there is a natural body. There is a spiritual uh, body. And um, just as we have borne the likeness of the earthly man, so shall we bear the likeness of the man from heaven and uh, then he goes on to describe this body as one which is imperishable and uh, uh, characterized by immortality and, and, and so on. So uh, uh, we are going to bear the likeness to the, the second Adam as we have borne the likeness to the first Adam, the, the earthly man with his earthly body. And there is the body of Christ's glory that we will also share in the likeness of that. Does someone have First John uh, passage for us, please? Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not yet appeared what we shall be. We know that when he appears, we shall be like him, because we shall see him just as he is. 
Yeah, okay, thank you. So, and, that, and, and in addition to that, just one other thing, a little broader in, in, in scope, but I think an interesting one, is uh, in a way the whole theme of the, uh, of the New Testament apocalypse of, of John, the book of Revelation, uh, is this theme of, of, the, of the, the transformation of the church, the, the, the corporate <coughs> of God, into the likeness of, of uh, Jesus, the, the one from heaven. So that's the apocalypse opens in the, the first chapter with uh, this uh, stunning revelation of the Son of Man garbed uh, with uh, the glory spirit, the blazing uh, 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 flame uh, appearance at the sight of which John falls down is uh, virtually dead. And so here is the, the light of the world uh, before the, the eyes of uh, John. And, and presently then he, he speaks about how this light of the world is standing in the midst of, of the churches uh, who are little lights of the world. Already you're getting the idea that we are made like unto the Christ. Uh, uh, we are the candlesticks that here that the seven the, the churches are so represented as a reflective of, of the likeness of, of Christ that marvelous light in the world has uh, appeared at the beginning of all of this. And uh, so the story of, of likeness in terms of this kind of luminosity is being told and uh, the whole really story of the book of Revelation is how uh, the church is transformed from uh, this sort of candlestick of a light likeness uh, until you get to the end of the book where the church is caught up into and becomes part of the glory, spirit, heavenly temple. Not that we become divine, obviously, but uh, like the, the angels, we are caught up into that heavenly reality so that the new Jerusalem, uh, the heaven, the Sabbath, and the uh, final uh, form of, the, the, of this cosmic holy of holies, cuboid, like the, the Old Testament holy of holies, that, that ultimate uh, temple of God is, is the bride of Christ. So there is a coalescence of the people of God with the, the, the heavenly reality itself. And, uh, and so the church has come from the point where it is just sort of a dim reflection of the likeness of the Savior uh, to share in, in the full luminous glory of, 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 of the Savior in, in the, the New Jerusalem. And uh, certainly the, the elements of, of uh, outward glory are, 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 are part of that. That picture. So physical glorification. Then now this was a, a component. As I said, you have to uh, say when as well as uh, what. Uh, this was a, a third component then of the image of God that Adam did not possess in the beginning. As the First Corinthians 15 passage uh, points out, the first Adam is characterized by an earthy body, which was necessary in order for the purposes of, of earth history that God had in view the procreation of of the community, the filling of, of the earth, and uh, then, however, uh, beyond the, that uh, earthy body, there is uh, the, the glorified body that comes, but Adam doesn't have it at, at the beginning. When the whole earthy cultural enterprise was completed, <coughs> then he could lay aside his earthy body and then receive this third component. Huh? So he is created uh, with dominion, uh, he's created with moral excellence, and he's created with the Sabbath promise of glorification where you get this third component and of course in terms of uh, the covenant of creation it doesn't work out that way it is in terms of redemption that the second Adam achieves that for us so that now when we get there it is a uh, uh, taking on of a likeness of the second Adam uh, glorified uh, Christ in heaven all right so the, now I think that sums up most of the biblical specific references to and it's the image of God, and it's these three features, these glory spirit type features uh, that, that are consistently uh, present. Now then let's take up the question a little further of, of when we've described what constitutes uh, the spirit, and I just said something a little bit more about the when. When man was first created, I just said he had two components, he didn't have the third one, he would have had the third one in, in due time if he passed his probation and, and so forth. He fell. What happened in the fall? What happened to the image of God when man fell? Does any of it remain? Uh, are the, the unregenerate, uh, first of all, out there, those, those who haven't experienced salvation, re redemption, re regeneration, uh, should, should we regard the, the unregenerate as in any sense at all still possessing in, uh, any of the components of, of the image of God? And here we might be inclined to, to say, uh, no, they've lost it all, were it not that they're are at least a couple of passages in Scripture that uh, compel us to 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 modify that 
somewhat. And uh, the two particular passages, uh, let's see, one, well, uh, let's see, one is the one we already looked at back in Genesis 9, verse 6. The other will be in, in James uh, 3, verse 9. In Genesis 9, verse 6, there were the two interpretations, you remember, that I, I suggested. Uh, if, if, uh, if you shed man's blood by man, shall your blood there be shed because in the image of God he made man. And uh, either on the traditional interpretation or on my interpretation of the thing, uh, either way, you are apparently here referring and not just to believers, but to, but to un unbelievers, and uh, they are being referred to as as image of God, the, the victim. So suppose, <coughs> suppose that the traditional view is right, and you're talking about the, the victim. Mm -hmm. Well, the, the victims of murder would very often be unbelievers as well as believers, and, and the explanation of that of the capital punishment would be because that, that unbeliever that that you killed was uh, uh, was the image of God. Or uh, on the view that I took, that it's referring to the fact that, that the judge himself is the image of God. It would not always be believers uh, who were who were acting as judges, especially in terms of God's uh, common grace arrangements, which is the context. Uh, uh, this will be a common privilege of unbelievers and believers uh, to uh, have the special office of the king and the judge in human society. <coughs> so once again, the uh, image of Godness would be attributed to someone who is an unbeliever, e either way. So that's Genesis 9, 6 seems to demand something along that line. The other passage is the one in James 3, 9, which is warning us against a uh, wrong use of our tongues, and especially then uh, because with our tongues we bless God, and with these same tongues perverse that we are, uh, we, we curse men, hmm? men who are made in the image of God. Now, who are we cursing? Well, we shouldn't be cursing anyone, but, but if we proceed to curse someone, it's, uh, it's, it's probably more likely it's not that we'd be uh, cursing some unbelievers and we'd be cursing our, our uh, brothers and sisters in, in uh, the Lord. And uh, so that passage, too, then, seems to be suggesting uh, uh, caution in our dealing with, with uh, the unbelieving folk because. Uh, Somehow they are still the image of God. So as I said, uh, with modified language of some uh, kind, you have to get across the idea that it's part of God's common grace. There is a, uh, not just the provision of institutions like the state and so on, which are fine, uh, but that there's an inward restraint on the development of evil and, uh, within men so that we speak about remnants and uh, we speak about uh, unbelievers Although, you know, whatsoever is not of faith is, is <coughs> sin, so everything they do is sin. And uh, nevertheless, outwardly, some things that they do conform to God's requirements. And so traditionally, we speak about civil good. Huh? They, they're still able, they, they don't have this perfect moral excellence and, and, so, and so on, but they're still able to do something which can be called civil good. And uh, the, the, that maybe is a good way as any to re refer to it. Uh, in terms of dominion, uh, they, they certainly uh, do share to some extent in the continuing dominion that man has over the subhuman cre uh, creation. That's part of God's common grace. They, they still are able to uh, uh, be appointed to special offices in, in human government of uh, one sort or another. And so they, they, they share that. Obviously, they don't have the third ingredient any more than, than uh, we do. But uh, uh, that's the unregenerate. As for the regenerate, well... We do have whatever the, the unbelievers have in terms of common grace, and beyond that, uh, well, we are regenerate. Huh? And the, the deepest principle in our life now, although not perfectly sanctified, the deepest principle in our life is that uh, this moral excellence that we have in Christ of, of uh, righteousness and holiness and love of the truth, that from the, our heart of hearts uh, we do, and we're making further progress. Uh, uh, but we have, in, in that way, uh, the, the second component, and of course the first component, as I said, we have the same as, uh, as any, uh, other people do in, in terms of uh, dominion over the world and, and, and special office and, and so on. And in, and in the sense that we can appreciate in the New Testament, uh, that we are already... Uh, there in, in the heavens in our spirits so with, with Christ uh, and uh, so we are and then that already not yet type of analysis of New Testament eschatology there is the, the mystical spiritual already experience of um, our bodies in this world but our spirits in, in the heavens and somehow sharing 
in, in, in that uh, our reign in heaven so that we have that first component of uh, the image of dominion in a way that our unbelievers uh, wouldn't. There's a third component? No, we don't have that either. Uh, and we won't until we see him. Then we will be like him. Meanwhile, we continue to live our lives in this mortal body and it will be dust to dust for us unless our Savior comes uh, while we are, are still uh, living. So uh, that is a matter of of, of hope for us. All right, let's turn to the story uh, now to the, the final judgment. At the final judgment, uh, in, insofar as, uh, as uh, let's say, the reprobate are concerned, there's no more common grace. So all the benefits that, that came to them in terms of common grace are removed. There's nothing left for them. I would say that, that uh, at the final judgment, uh, then as for the reprobate, along well, with Satan and all his hosts, and those angels that had in some sense shared the image of God. <coughs> and there is nothing left of the image of, of, of God uh, for, for the reprobate in, in, in hell. It's <coughs> the first component, the second or the third. Uh, there's a resurrection body. Uh, there's a general resurrection, which includes the resurrection of, of the wicked as well as the righteous. But it is not a, a glorified body. That uh, would be that, uh, that third feature of the, the image of God. So there, now, you see, uh, on a traditional side, it's not coextensive in humans. And uh, so, uh, my analysis of, of the reprobate, they are no longer in, in any sense of degree whatsoever the image of God. They are still human uh, 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 beings. As for the elect, okay, yeah, you can clearly see what we will say here. As for the elect, uh, our dominion now is perfected. <coughs> With Christ, we are reigning over all, all the cosmos. And we have even judged angels and so on, as Paul says we will. And uh, so there is a perfecting of, of our glorious dominion over the world, and where we are we are under Christ, with Christ, masters of the cosmos. Uh, and uh, so we have that dominion. And then as, as for the moral excellence, uh, and that's there. Now our sanctification is, is perfected. And, uh, and uh, as for physical glorification, at last, now, uh, th that comes. And, uh, and so there, in, in the glorified elect, uh, we have the ultimate expression of, of man as the image of, of God. So uh, this, uh, now your question was, uh, no, no, the rep you just answered that was the one as to the reprobate. Uh, right. so you're saying reprobate is not me. I, I was saying that well, at that point, when the final judgment, and when common grace is uh, ended, then to uh, all right, we would uh, any uh, entertain any comments, sir? Yes. If you were to judge angels, does that imply that there will be sin in angels? Well, I, I think it's referring. I, yeah, I think it's referring especially to uh, our role in sharing with Christ in the final judgment of Satan and, and his angels. I didn't hear him. Any other points? Yes. Um, isn't that the, the, the luminosity of the image of God and the Holy Spirit? Um, why would there be darkness on the face of the deep presence of the Holy Spirit? Because the. Uh, the invisible that's the glory spirit is part of the invisible dimension and and so in, in terms of uh, of, uh, of this world that there's this darkness uh, that, uh, in other words you know sometimes in trying to explain how there could be light before there were uh, luminaries on day four people are suggesting that that just that, that the, the end of the world that the glory of God will obviate uh, the, uh, the need for any other luminary so that there will be no need for the light of the sun. Sometimes suggest that by that kind of logical goal was uh, uh, already present that at the beginning and that there was a supernatural and glory presence of God that was right up the world. Well, that's a complete contradiction of, of the whole structure of that technology. We're not at the consummation. And uh, moreover, the presence of such a glory of God um, when it is there, ultimately he does away with the sequence of day and night, whereas what we have here at the beginning is, is a sequence of day and night, and so therefore, the, it's not the end, but the sex thing when I'm saying this, that the glorious spirit that I'm describing is part of the invisible world of the upper register. And, 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 
uh, you can no more see it today and you could see it then, or you can no more see it then and you can see it today, so it would have no effect on, on your experience of life and um, I wonder what you think of the view. Uh, I picked up somewhere uh, where uh, Moses is using, uh, when he talks about the image of God, he's using, using a, apparently a, a practice that was an extent at the time in which a king would yeah. set up statues of himself yeah. on the yeah. perimeters of his kingdom. Yeah. That, that's a point that's often made when it's uh, uh, <coughs> they're emphasizing the idea of dominion. Yeah. And what it involves then is, is that uh, that we're talking about something which is representational. Uh, no, no, excuse me. We're, we're, on that view, you'd be talking uh, about a representative principle that uh, we are representatives of, 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 of God in this world. And of course, there is an element of truth in that, that, that God is the king of all things and, and we are ruling in his name. Sort of as a, there's a vicegerency that's going on there where, where we are ruling in his name. But what I would maintain is that that is not the point when it's talking about man as being <coughs> God. The point is not that we are representative of God, but that we are representational of God. The idea is that we are chips off the old block, if you can say it reverently. Huh? It's the idea of sonship. Now, a son is not like the father in that he is representative of the father's authority. The son is like the father in, in representational sense, so that he's like his father. And that's the whole emphasis in the Bible. That image means that we are like God, not representatives of God. And, and that, that point that you make, which is in a lot of the literature, is it's missing the, the, the key point that here, that image equals likeness to, to God, and not just um, representative of the capacity. Uh, my question has to do with uh, Adam and Eve's perception of their nakedness. And I was thinking to one, either because their moral excellence had changed, or no, that before, I mean, that's a little off to try to come to it, and or before they had some sort of, um, can you hold it until we come to that, and, and, and if I haven't answered it, then you can bring it up. I guess I'm running ahead of this. Yeah. <coughs> okay. well, uh, I understand you say um, the unregenerate now are in the image of God <coughs> in a royal judicial sense. In a what sense? The royal judicial sense only? No, no, the, uh, no, I, we also talked uh, about the sort of civil good that the, the, um, they, they might do it. I mean, the, they, parents, unbelieving parents, uh, they show affection, uh, some kind of care for their children. This is a, you know, a formal compliance uh, with uh, that, they, uh, that they engage in, uh, in various ways. In, Subduing of the world and farming, this, that, and the other thing. Farming is good in the formal sense, and so on. So, uh, in, uh, they do civil good uh, as well, in some limited sense. Let's say 20 of them already. Uh, <coughs> better not move on to anything else. I mean, if there's another comment or question in connection with what we've been dealing with, you're all hungry. <laughs> great benefit that the Lord could appeal to that should excite man's gratitude namely the way in which a man had been so nobly created that he was an Elohim type creature he was made in uh, the image of God with uh, dominion and with moral excellence and with the prospect of glorification and uh, now in addition to that, was the uh, all all the benefits uh, involved in uh, the wondrous beauty and, and goodness of the created world, and uh, which the Lord placed man. And so we get into an analysis of that in uh, page 30 in King of Prologue under the heading of Kingdom Endowment. Now, what we'll be uh, saying about that. Uh, uh, can be summed up maybe in the expression which is used in the Bible or that namely the garden of God the garden of God and, and that uh, phrase brings out the, the, the two aspects uh, the, it is of God and uh, therefore it has a holy character it's, it's a sanctuary where, where man is placed in Eden and of course the term garden brings out the, the, the physical attractiveness and uh, bounty of 
of the place, uh, and uh, so it's a paradise, as we have been often referred to it, paradise, and at the end of history, consummation, uh, uh, paradise regained, and, and actually that formula, paradise regained, isn't quite adequate because the, the, the final consummated world is not just a restoration of the original Edenic order, but it is uh, the, the ultimate uh, glorified state of uh, affairs. But certainly the original order was one uh, of paradise, it was a garden. Uh, in the Kingdom Prologue, we deal within the sequence first that it was a holy place because it was the garden of God. It was a sanctuary, and so on page 31 we have that heading there, the kingdom as a sanctuary, and, and uh, to be such then, though, though it must be the place uh, where the Lord's presence uh, is involved, and so we then sort of just, uh, detail some of the biblical evidence that we've already noted, plus a little bit more, that God's presence was, as a matter of fact, there with man in uh, in, in the Garden of Eden. And uh, so once again, we go back to Genesis so 1, 2, the reality of, of uh, the, the glorious spirit and, and, and his involvement. In Genesis 1, 26, at that point where man is, is being brought upon the scene to be located in, in Eden, uh, once again, uh, the let us, we were saying, signalize the presence of, of uh, the, this theophanic presence of God uh, on on the scene and the creation of uh, man, as well as in Genesis 2, 7, the material that we've already uh, discussed. Uh, I, I did also refer to uh, the, the passage in Genesis 3, 8, uh, uh, which is the, the coming of God to deal with the situation immediately after the fall. And uh, they are trying to uh, make the point that was described there is a parousia event, a, a presence of uh, the glory of spirit with the, the, the angels in, in an act of judgment. And so uh, there you are, Adam and Eve, and, Eve and, and, and the, the presence uh, of, of the God of glory with, with the angels there ready to enter into judgment with them on uh, that occasion. Uh, we appeal to Ezekiel 28:13 where the prophet Ezekiel pictured the cherubim attended glory as present there on the holy mountain of God. And uh, that expression is also illuminating uh, to us the mountain of God. So God's presence was there. And uh, therefore, in our thinking about Eden, since it mentions the mountain of God, I think we have to include that, that topographical feature that uh, what we encounter later on in, in Israel, which is a, a recapitulation of this, where you have Sinai, and, and, and more particularly Zion, Zion, the holy mountain of God in, in the midst of, of uh, the, the holy kingdom of God, the cultic focus for the whole uh, land of Israel, that is a, evidently a, a recapitulation of, of the original situation, which involved uh, right at the, the, the center and, and heart and focus of man's existence and life and, and, and work, a, a, a mountain, a, a, a a vertical access connecting our earth and, and uh, heaven, the original staircase, uh, if you will, uh, at the top of which, as uh, on Zion, I think we then should assume is, is the presence of, of the revelation <coughs> of God's uh, uh, glory uh, in, in that theophanic form of the heavenly reality accommodated to, to Adam and Eve in their our earthly uh, uh, life and so uh, Ezekiel refers to it there uh, as uh, the, the holy mountain of God. So that when we are thinking about Eden, I think that that, that is something. Uh, there is the kavod, uh, the, there is the glory of, of God. That there is the cultic focus. Uh, that is central to all that's going on. But there is the presence of God there. And uh, that presence of God sanctifies uh, the, the whole uh, enterprise. We'll find as we move along and we study the, the task that man had to, to perform, that uh, there was to be a movement out from the cultic focus uh, in terms of a cultural expansion so that you get a cultural wholeness. Uh, that, that's going to be the, the goal, but you start with this uh, center, the, the, the cultic focus of man's uh, uh, probation and life and, and so on, uh, which would give character to everything so that uh, everything is holy. This is holy, but then the, the expansion of everything before the fall then would have been a, a holy enterprise and uh, uh, achieving fullness, but with the, this cultic uh, focus for the whole thing uh, at all times and to this mountain of God is 
um, uh, involves the concept of uh, Armageddon. That's the name of this uh, mountain uh, from the beginning. It is the mountain where the glory spirit with all the holy angels, the, 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 the equivalent of the heavenly reality, come down here into a visible focus on earth. Uh, that's the thing that crowns this particular mountain, this Har mountain, and makes it the, the Mount of Assembly, which is what Begeden means, uh, the Hebrew word Moed, which means uh, council, it's assembly, the divine council of God with his angels, just rendered into Greek form as uh, again. So uh, in your idea of Armageddon, this is where to begin. It's the original Zion. Uh, later on, the Zion is identified as uh, the Mount of Assembly and you know, see and so on. But here's the original one. And uh, this is what uh, gives uh, meaning and significance to the fact then that Satan would enter into this holy place where he doesn't belong and, and that constitutes a challenge against the, the God of glory on Armageddon. Here is the original battle of Armageddon then. Uh, the ultimate battle of Armageddon is precisely uh, the same thing. It is Satan challenging uh, the claims of God and his Christ on, on, on the heavenly Zion, the heavenly Ar Ar Armageddon. But here is the, the original battle. Adam loses the, this battle of Armageddon. The second Adam uh, must and does win the ultimate battle of uh, Armageddon. But your eschatology is the elements of it, you know, are right here from the beginning in so, so, so many ways. So right now we're talking about then the fact that there is this glory presence of, of God here on the Armageddon Mountain of God right uh, from the outset. I'll just maybe finish the evidence for this and then entertain your questions. And, and so Ezekiel calls it, therefore, the Mountain of God agreeably, agreeably when the prophets depict the redemptive restoration of this what Christ accomplishes by way of, of restoring it that they portray uh, this presence of the glory cloud they, they, they say that there's a the river of life there and the tree of life there you know it's paradise restored as we were saying uh, but always within that picture it's uh, the, the presence of the, the glory of God is there once again because the glory of God was part of the original uh, picture by positioning by positioning in the glory, his glory upon uh, the uh, Mount of Eden's garden, God placed there the claim of his name. The glory, you know, one of the titles for it is his name, his shame as well as kavod, and, and so forth. So man's home site, uh, what we uh, gather from this, uh, is that man's home site uh, was a holy place. It was hallowed ground. The Garden of Eden was not only the original land flowing with milk and honey, it was the original holy land as a whole paradise was a sanctuary it was a temple garden and uh, so Ezekiel calls it an expression I used at the beginning a garden of God that comes from Ezekiel 28 and so on as we say there and Isaiah also calls it the garden of the Lord Isaiah 51 uh, 3 then further indications that this was a holy place and ought to be conceived there of course a sanctuary so that man right away from the outset is obviously a priest you see he's placed in a holy place with all the functions appertaining uh, there too and uh, another clear indication that uh, this was a holy place a cultic site of God's special uh, uh, presence uh, another indication is found in, in the steps that were taken to preserve its sanctity after man fell this brings us back to the Genesis 3.22 text we were talking about now man has become like one of us with respect to knowing and good and evil he did it the wrong way he's forfeited his right to be here out with him and you cherubim, you cherubim now locate yourself with the, uh, the flaming sword turning every way to maintain what? Well, obviously to maintain the, the sanctity of this place from further alien in, encroachment uh, upon it. And so the steps taken after the fall to maintain the character, the holy character of the place, of course, uh, uh, tell us eloquently that it has all along been precisely that, a, a holy place whose uh, sanctity uh, must be uh, preserved. Also marking the Garden of Eden as a sacred place was the divinely appointed symbols of covenant religion, namely the tree of life in the midst of the garden. And uh, consonant with the fact that the garden was the place of divine theophany, it was also the site of revelation, oracular revelation, word revelation that, that came. It was the holy place where man heard the voice of God speaking uh, to uh, him and uh, and so forth. Uh, so uh, 
uh, that's what we're trying to establish, the, all of the varied evidence uh, that God was uh, present and that uh, this was uh, a, a holy uh, place. Chosen as the focal throne site of the glory spirit, the Garden of Eden was a microcosmic earthly version of the cosmic temple. It was the site of a visible vocal projection of the heavenly temple down to earth. At the first, then, man's native dwelling place coincided with God's earthly dwelling place. It was God's earthly dwelling that he chose for himself, and he invites man to be a house guest there in his own house, dwelling in the courts of the Lord from uh, uh, the beginning. This focal sanctuary in Eden was designed to be a medium whereby man might experience the joy of the presence of God in a way and on a scale most suited to his nature and condition as an earthly creature during the first stage of his historical journey before his glorification while walking with uh, God. So, <clears throat> point one, uh, God places man in, in, in a, a place where he himself is present, and that's the ultimate glory, is it not? And this is the secret of eternal life and all ble um, blessing to be near to the presence of God, who is light and joy and shalom forever. All right, now there was a, a hand or two, and I, I do want to make some progress as uh, yeah, yeah, quickie. Um, what do you exactly mean by cult? Like I can draw from your... Yeah, oh, okay, that, that's a good question I've been asked uh, several times, and uh, the word cult tends to uh, uh, conjure up visions of uh, wild, long-haired, crazy people doing all sorts of <laughs> things in some narrow uh, household in Southern California, usually. Uh, okay. <laughs> but uh, all we mean by cult is a perfectly neutral thing is that man has vertical relationship to God <coughs> he has horizontal relationships to the world and, and to other people his vertical yeah, great stuff. <laughs> <laughs> his, his vertical relationship to God is cult uh, our, our relating to God in the appropriate way as, as priests in, in adoration praise and, and, and so on now that's what we mean by, by, by cult and our, our relating uh, horizontally to uh, the rest of creation, including uh, fellow human beings and so on. That's culture. Okay. The other hand. <coughs> so, my question. That was the same question. Okay. All right. Moving on then. Uh, uh, this idea of, of sanctuary, all right, it's a holy place, <coughs> um, but it's it's a holy. <coughs> it comes quite obvious. That it, then as, as the cultural mandate is fulfilled and, and you are expanding that, that you, you are uh, dealing with a, a territory, uh, the reality you're, you're talking about is uh, something geophysical. Uh, there is that, that dimension to this uh, sanctuary and it is this combination of, of things uh, that uh, we have in mind then when we use the term theocracy to describe the, this original order. Uh, this expression of, of, of the kingdom of God uh, is a theocracy, and this is a, an important concept then to, to get hold of just what we mean uh, by a theocracy. And uh, let's see, page 32. The peculiar kind of kingdom established at Eden at the beginning, and which later on you have it, for example, in, in Israel, uh, when we were quickly doing the common grace chart thing we said that between the fall and the consummation we have this common grace line and then we have the, the, the holy line of, of, of the covenant community and uh, you can begin with a theocracy and the consummation is, uh, is, is a theocracy and I said that in between uh, you have Israel is a theocracy and then that one other square, the, the, the Ark Kingdom is, is a theocracy, but primarily then uh, in history, post lapsarian history, uh, you have a theocracy then in, in Israel, you have it there. apart from that, you don't have uh, a theocracy. So the peculiar kind of kingdom established at Eden at the beginning and picked up again in, in an example like uh, Israel <laughs> differs radically from other kinds of world kingdoms that arise after the fall. Uh, and uh, we use the word theocracy for that. Whatever analogies exist between the theocracy and other kingdoms, there's only really one genuine theocracy. There, there are analogies, 
Uh, let's say you have down here the, the institution of the state on the line of common grace. That the state is an institution, and there are certain analogies uh, functionally between what goes on in the, the Israelite theocracy and what goes on in the state, along with the most fundamental uh, great uh, differences. Uh, uh, both are involved in in adjudication of problems and what, what and so on, uh, uh, legal uh, procedures, uh, but that the state is, is not a theocracy, should not be a theocracy. Uh, this is a problem with the theonomy for one thing, that it is trying to change a common grace institution to something God never intended it to be, and namely a, a theocracy. Because it's n not such a uh, theocracy, then it is uh, something quite distinctive. What makes something a, a, a theocracy? Well, second paragraph, theocracy implies for one thing an external realm. That's why I began to say it has a geophysical dimension to it. It involves an external realm. You don't have a theocracy if what you have is, uh, for example, as in, uh, all right, you're coming back to, to this. Here's the church. Here is the, the church in the present age, or before the consummation, between the end of the Old Testament theocracy and the introduction of the, the anti-typical theocracy. Here is the church. Uh, and uh, we can speak about this as a theocracy only in a very limited sense, it's, uh, in the sense that it would be an, an invisible theocracy. If you take account of, of the whole picture, including the upper register, the invisible realm where Christ is enthroned as, as the king, this whole thing, you might speak of as a theocracy, but it's an invisible theocracy on earth. It, uh, that doesn't constitute a visible expression. It's only if, if you take account by faith of, of, of the reality that Christ is enthroned in the heavens as, as king over all, uh, that you can speak about this as a theocracy. It, it is in this sense uh, that the New Testament can really pick up the language of the Old Testament theocracy about uh, a kingdom of priests and so on and identify the... the uh, the community of faith under the new covenant uh, as, as being such a, a, a kingdom of priests and a holy nation only in the sense that it includes that invisible uh, dimension but on earth uh, it does not meet the, uh, the church in terms of its New Testament uh, organization and so on it, it's not an external uh, realm it is a place where Christ's rule theocratic rule is coming to expression among us only spiritually Christ rules in your heart by his spirit through his words and, and so there is an invisible uh, spiritual reign of, of Christ within our heart but this does not come to expression in terms of an external realm if we can distinguish things that way so there is a spiritual reigning of Christ within us now but this does not come to expression in an earthly, geophysical, external type kingdom realm, and uh, so only in an invisible sense is uh, this a theocracy. But theocracy then does demand the ingredient of, of the external, not just the spiritual reign. Uh, as we've already observed, the Lord assumed. Um, well, excuse me, coming back to that second part, last paragraph on page 32. Uh, theocracy implies an external realm. It does not refer to a spiritual reign of God in the hearts of its people by itself, by itself, but includes this geopolitical dimension. On the other hand, theocracy involves something more than a general providential rule of God over men and nations. Now here what I'm trying to contrast uh, a theocracy with is what's going on, let's say, on the line of common grace. Now here you do have an external realm, the whole world out here, the whole external world is involved. And God is indeed the sovereign uh, over all that's going on within this realm. Nevertheless, this phenomena along this line uh, do not add up uh, uh, to theocracy is the point, because theocracy denotes a particular kingdom realm that God claims in a special way as his own. And that's precisely what doesn't happen in the realm of common grace. Uh, God does not claim any particular realm, uh, uh, any continent on earth, any nation you want to think of. No evidence that God has claimed them 
as specially his own. He doesn't call out of the general realm of common grace any particular country uh, <coughs> along this common grace line to be his own holy place, as he did in the case, let's say, of Israel. Now, there you have a theocracy precisely because God says that land, huh, from the brook of Egypt to the Euphrates, from the Mediterranean to the Jordan, that land that he gives the boundaries of and so on, that land is my land. This is what I claim out of the whole common profane uh, world east of Eden. I claim this particular spot as, as my own. I set it aside. And uh, see, that's what's uh, necessary for a theocracy is that God makes such a choice, such an identification of himself with a particular place. Uh, you don't vote in theocracies. Huh? Uh, God decides where there's going to be a theocracy. Huh? A theocracy, and, and, and that's it. That's another thing that's right with uh, the theonomy. They think that uh, if only you get a uh, good enough nose count someplace, enough Christians, that, that then the, the idea is that you, you say, okay, the United States now is a, is a Christian nation, it's a theocracy, we're going to enforce all of the laws of o Old Testament uh, religion in here, including the, the, the execution of un unbelief. No, you, you don't vote it in. It requires a, a supernatural, special appointment of God where he says, this is mine. And, and moreover, he, he registers that choice uh, by a supernatural presence in it. Uh, he registers that, that choice through a covenant. Huh? It requires a special covenant revelation to set up, to inaugurate, initiate a, a, a theocracy. God must do that then by a special covenantal revelation. Where he does it, he then arranges that within this site there will be an expression uh, of his heavenly palace where he will take uh, local residence on earth and will manifest. In other words, the whole phenomenon we've been talking about of, of the heavenly glory spirit coming to earth and, 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 uh, and residing in the midst of God's people, that has to happen for a theocracy. This is not about to take place in earth history during the church age or anything. It's waiting until... Uh, the final judgment, therefore, theocracies are out of order completely. They, they are eschatologically and uh, up to uh, the, the decree uh, if, if you're trying to establish them before that. By making the Edenic kingdom his dwelling place, God sanctified it to himself. He imparted to it that holiness which is peculiar to theocracy. So uh, an external dimension is needed an external dimension involving divine definition and, and